Hi, thanks for coming. This is going to be our last uh, in-class uh, guest lecture of the series, but we're certainly ending it on a good note. Uh, my friend Andrew Roche is here. Um, you may have noticed that I like people that have an eclectic background, and Andrew certainly uh, falls into that category. Um, in addition to his contributions in technology, he's made significant contributions in the music industry, uh, the education industry, and uh, the and the political sphere. Uh, in music, back in the day, Andrew uh, turned a Polish dance hall into what is, well, I guess now it's the Fillmore, the, Fil the Fillmore Irving Plaza, but a Andrew opened up uh, Irving Plaza in that location, um, having well-known artists there, from Bob Dylan and Eric Clapton to the Dave Matthews Band. Um, he also founded the digital uh, club network, which was the first live streaming um, application on the internet, um, as well as the plugin, which was the first and largest digital music conference. Uh, in education, Andrew is the founder of mouse.org, which is making opportunities for upgrading schools in education. So that's a nonprofit that um, tries to wire uh, public schools in, onto the internet. And he's been doing that since uh, 1997. Uh, in politics, uh, Andrew, in 2005, he ran for uh, public advocate of New York. Uh, one of the major platforms he ran on was uh, getting Wi-Fi around the city, which is something he still works uh, as an advocate for. He's also advised many senators and congressmen on uh, issues in, uh, in technology, both uh, how to use technology for their campaigns and for governance. Uh, as well as uh, technological policy. Um, he's appeared on all the major networks, uh, including CNN, ABC, NBC, Fox, and CBS, uh, speaking on such issues. Uh, most recently, he co-founded a great conference called the PDF Conference, which is now more than just a conference. It's a community that, um, that's involved in the intersection of technology and politics. That's actually where I met Andrew. Uh, you don't know this, Andrew, but uh, the first year you had it, I actually didn't pay for the conference, but I crashed the party that you had afterwards. It was a great party. I met a lot of very interesting people, including Andrew. Uh, I've since been a, a paying member of the conference. It's a really great conference that I highly recommend uh, going to, as well as the, the techpresident.com, which, um, which talks a lot about, again, policy issues and how they relate uh, to political candidates. Uh, I recommend checking it out. He's also a senior advisor to a wonderful uh, uh, project called the Sunlight Foundation, which uh, hopefully Andrew will talk about today, and uh, it's something you, you should all learn about. Um, you know, what, what's really cool about all his work, you know, he's done all these different things, but if you look if, for an underlying theme in what he's doing, he really sees technology as you know, a platform to make the world a better place, whether it's in politics or music or in education. And uh, you know, that, that's something that I share as well. So uh, Andrew Roche. Thank you. Um, so I have a little bit of a slide presentation that I put together for today. Um, but before we get there, I thought I'd maybe Give you a, it moves pretty quickly, but I wanted to sort of give you a quick um, history of how I actually got involved in politics because it was a complete accident for me. Um, I, uh, as Evan just mentioned, I it's opened up Irving Plaza and uh, it was late 80s, early 90s, and Rudy Giuliani was the mayor of New York and he swore that he was going to close down all the nightclubs because he thought they were all bad for the city. And, uh, and I was scared to death that he was going to close down mine. So as a protective measure, I joined the community board uh, to you know, make myself into a good citizen and you know, get my credentials so that if, in fact, the mayor showed up, I wouldn't be locked up or closed down. And one of the projects that, uh, that uh, the community board was working on, to be, act to be completely clear, it's actually the 14th Street bid, which is sort of like a quasi-community board for that, for Union Square. And uh, I walked into a public school across the street. They, they, were, they were working on a public, trying to help a public school across the street called Washington Irving High School, um, which had 97% of its students minority and 97% of its students on school lunch, um, which was a pretty, uh, pretty uh, difficult situation, considering the fact that it was located in the heart of Manhattan in a very affluent area, 
And at the at two or three o'clock in the afternoon, 3,000 kids would pour onto the streets and there were fights and s windows broken and all kinds of problems. So I walked into that school and it was, I guess it was about 1997 uh, after having worked there uh, in the neighborhood and I s realized I didn't have a single computer anywhere in the school, not one. So I was shocked found some used computers, ordered a T1 line, which at that time cost $6,000, and sent an email to 10 of my friends asking them if they would come and help me build a computer lab in the school. And on that Saturday, when they were all supposed to show up, instead of 10 friends, I was surprised that 200 people came, because my friends sent it to their friends, and there was a community in New York called Silicon Alley, <laughs> which was sort of a counterpart to Silicon Valley, which had a whole bunch of technology people who were very excited about the technology and wanted to see it expanded and wanted to see it empower people just the way many of you and I do. So that inspired me to start an organization called Mouse, which Evan mentioned, and we you know, raised some money and started wiring schools and eventually got to about 75 schools and we realized that the problem really wasn't the computers getting them wired. The problem was is there were no people in the school system that could actually make the computers turn into tools for learning. You know, they had at that time one systems admin for the entire district, which could encompass 60 or 70 schools. They couldn't afford to pay teachers $35,000 a year. They could not pay systems administrators 60 or $70,000. So out of frustration, I started a program called Mouse Squad, where we'd actually train the kids to fix and maintain the computers themselves. And uh, out of that frustration came a fantastic program that actually took off. And now that program is in over 100 schools in New York, but in 23 countries around the world. And the best statistic about it is, is that the average kid in the New York City school system graduates at about a 50% rate. Kids in the Mouse program graduate at a 90% rate. Now, that's a great statistic. And I started taking that statistic around to administrators of the school system and politicians, trying to get them to put more money into technology and empowering kids to basically break the chains of their own social and economic inequity themselves. And I got lots of nods and lots of, you know, this is great, but no action. In fact, I came up with a perspective on that at the time, which was that Politicians only listen to two types of people. They only listen to people who they get a lot of money from or people they give a lot of money to. Anybody in between, they're not interested in talking to, to them. And that's I, and the other, the other point I'd always try to make is that politicians don't know the difference between a server and a waiter. <laughs> but I tried, and I started talking to, you know, Daschle and Gephardt and Clinton and at some point, Daschle invited me to Washington to make a presentation on technology to all 50 senators. This was in May of 2001, this was before September 11th. And I remember walking to the Capitol and pinching myself and wondering, don't, I'm, a, I'm a former club owner. Don't they have like, the CIA or the FBI telling them about technology? And I went into this room, gave a presentation about the digital divide facing the Democratic Party. <coughs> Pretty simple presentation. A, that Republicans were outspending them 10 to 1. B, that they were voting down broadband spending bills, which was like voting down a federal subsidy for your own party. And C, they didn't have any legislative aids or people looking at legislation and determining whether or not legislation would become obsolete because of technology or whether it might be supported by technology. How do you actually convert legislative action from the 20th to the 21st century? Nobody in Capitol, on Capitol Hill was focused on that in 2001. I finished by making my presentation, and 50 senators are all assembled at this lunch. And the first person who raises her hand is Senator Dianne Feinstein, who is the senator from Silicon Valley. Remember, this is 2001. And she says, Senator Daschle, I don't believe the Senate should be on the internet. Until we get rid of pornography and pedophilia, we should get rid of, I mean, get rid of it once and for all. The Senate should avoid the internet at all costs. And the next person who raises his hand is Ch Senator Chuck Schumer, who says, hey, Andrew, nice to see you. I get 10,000 emails a day. How do I get it to stop? 
I swear to God. <laughs> so I decided at that point that this was not going to be something that was going to happen anytime fast. And I basically stopped, you know, I stopped taking your phone calls for $10,000 donations and stopped taking your phone calls asking for me to make presentations because I just didn't believe that they were going to get it. And in 2003, a number of the staffers who had been at some of those presentations working for the senators were now working for Howard Dean. And the Howard Dean juggernaut started. And uh, I see Brits here was one of, the, one of the people who was involved. And, and so they invited me to, to uh, join. And uh, I got a lofty title called uh, Chairman of the Technology Advisory Council for Howard Dean. But this is where my presentation um, picks up because um, I actually think Howard Dean didn't get it. So Howard, as you know, was there may have been some use of the internet in politics before 2004, but the first time it really got on the radar screen of the public was, was his campaign. And one of, the, one of the sad things about Howard was that as he was running his campaign when he first started pretty much the old fashioned way. He was running around the, he was running, sorry about this, I just put this together. Blogs started the ball rolling. So Howard was running around, running around the country saying something that was very important to a lot of Democrats, which was that George Bush was wrong. And he didn't have a lot of money, Howard, so he left a whole bunch of kids up in Burlington working on his website, maybe one or two adults to manage them. And he went around the country pontificating about how George Bush was wrong. Now, the blogosphere was just starting to come into being in a, fund, you know, in a, in a de very demonstrative way. And Howard goes in, let's say, to the Peoria, Illinois Gazette and says, George Bush is wrong. And the Peoria, Illinois Gazette, the next day, writes an editorial that says, uh, basically, Howard Dean just came to visit us, and he said George Bush is wrong. So people read that in the paper. The next day, they Google Howard Dean, and they arrive at the Dean for America website. And then they write to the Dean for America website and say, hey, we think your boss is cool. Do you care if we create a Peoria, Illinois for Howard Dean blog? And since there were no adults up in Burlington, the kids said, sure, go right ahead. <laughs> and before you know it, there were punk rockers for Howard Dean. There were lesbians for Howard Dean. There were every single town, every single issue. There was blogs after blogs after blogs. And they started forming a community around his candidacy. When he got to, and there was no such thing as Facebook and MySpace. It was pretty much blogs and email lists and, and, and uh and uh, static websites promoting his candidacy. And he came to New York for a series of meetings, and a young man called up him and Joe Trippi and suggested that he could make time to come and meet his friends. And they had already had their schedule completely filled. So they said, sorry, we can't. And the young man complained and said, well, I've got 300 people assembled. 300 people? OK, we'll change our plans. So they went to the Essex Lounge down on Avenue A, they walked in, and yes, there were 300 people assembled. And they knew that their staff could not have assembled 300 people. They had been assembled using a tool called Meetup. And the next day in the New York Times was an article that basically said, Howard, De Howard Dean, or, uh, 300 people organized on the internet to meet Howard Dean. And voila, the first presidential internet candidate was born. Now, obviously, there was a lot more to that. The, the, you know, they started, Howard Dean campaign started blogging and building and, and nurturing the community. But for the most part, Howard himself thought that the reason this was good was because he could raise a lot of money. He didn't realize that money is not the product. It's actually the byproduct. And so he didn't really take the money that he was raising and reinvesting it into the web. And we all know what happened later, which was orange caps in Iowa and $22 million wasn't enough. And the scream was an accident. <laughs> I don't know if you knew this about Howard Dean, but Howard, as he, he lost Iowa, he also did like, tried to do what Obama did this campaign, which was to get lots of people on the ground in Iowa, but he did it sort of in a very disorganized fashion giving kids orange caps and sending them, hoping that they were going to convince Iowans to vote for Howard. When he lost, 
His supporters were all gathered, and he was on a stage, concerned about keeping them enthused, and they had plugged him into the television monitors and forgot to plug him into the stage monitors. Now, if you've ever spoken in front of a large group of people with a microphone, if you can't hear yourself on the stage, you raise your voice. And because Howard Dean's personality and passion was in some cases being read as anger, when that scream happened, it basically had the entire media industry going, aha, that's it, we don't want that guy having his finger on the red button. So then came the net roots. Now the Democratic Party, the Republicans, as I mentioned earlier, had been investing in information technology for a long time, um, but they were still doing it in a top-down way. And they're, they're, they had really created amazing communications infrastructure think tanks, policy shops, all the way down to college Republicans. They stayed on message and they knew how to deliver it and how to be consistent. The Democratic Party did nothing close to what the Republicans were able to do. The entire Clinton-Gore years, the, Dem the Democrats did nothing to build up their infrastructure. So the Democratic Party's own rank and file, which commonly what I like to refer to as the net roots, basically took the technology and built their own infrastructure for the Democratic Party. And they started demanding action. And one of the things that they did was they went after Joe Lieberman. If you remember, they managed to get Joe Lieber Lieberman uh, out as the nominee for the Democratic Party. But they failed in getting him elected because Joe ended up running as an independent in Connecticut. And again, the political system and the mainstream press said that the internet doesn't matter, doesn't work, doesn't get anybody elected. But we were saved by YouTube and Makaka. And what would have 2008 been like if George Allen had actually won? My friend, we're going to run this campaign on positive, constructive ideas. And it's important that we motivate and inspire people for something. This fellow here over here with the, the yellow shirt, Makaka, or whatever his name is, he's with Black Pug and he's following us around everywhere. And it's just great. We're going to places all over Virginia. And he's having it on film, and it's great to have you here. You show it to your opponent because he's never been there, probably will never come. So it's good to be here. His opponent actually right now is a bunch of Hollywood movie moments. We care about that, not fiction. So welcome, let's give a welcome to Makaka here. Welcome to America and the real world of Virginia. I, I, you know, I remembered it, but I had to, when I watched it again, I was like, wow. So, everybody who started running for president decided, or most of the people who started running for president, decided to announce it online. And if you remember, Hillary Clinton announced her conversation with the American public online. Now, I always like to say that politicians at that point didn't really understand online video because, frankly, every time a video camera was pointed at them, they thought it was television. And they acted like it was television. And in her case, it was even worse because she put herself in a very formal setting and, and as if she was being interviewed on Meet the Press. And a lot of people in the internet community saw her announcement and they were like, you know, she's not really, she's not really getting it. You know, she's kind of being disingenuous because there's no real way to have a conversation with her. You could send an email to her, but there was no way of knowing whether the email had been received, whether yours would be answered, what other people thought of your email, could you find other people who were like you who also sent the same question. So Phil DeVolise, went ahead and using some very simple tools created a very important piece of media which I'm going to play for everybody because it's so good. I don't want people who already agree with me. I want honest, experienced people who are 
experienced, hardworking, patriotic people who want to be part of a team, the American team. Uh, I hope you've learned a little bit more about uh, what I'm believing and trying to do and really help this conversation about our country get started. I Good that was? For Hillary or against Hillary? It didn't look like it was for her. It was against her. But the message had been sent, and the people in the internet community recognized that. They were like, yeah, I agree with that, and sent it to their friends. And it started getting up to, I think it was about 500,000 views on YouTube. And then it jumped to the mainstream media and got shown on national television. And there was a sense that something was up. So. You know a little bit more about the history from there. Primaries battles continued. Barack Obama went to Iowa, wins Iowa. There is a, a clear message that's resonating from his campaign. And the internet community, in response to his message, decided that they wanted to respond in some way. So they and authenticity being an important part of it, created something that really, um, I am so sorry. I'm gonna jump ahead now, because I've got my slides all wrong. So this is a video that was done in response to Yes We Can by Hillary Clinton. And I'll just let you watch it. She gave us an edge. The belongs are going crazy. You have this spiritual anchor that you know Musically, this is the reason we're going to be the biggest band in the world. It was like a really magical time for us as a group. It really was a good class. Immediately, I called Max and I said, Dude, the group just took the band. I was like, Why? He goes, Hillary's running for president. <laughs> So, not many, how many of you have not seen that before? Okay, well, the reason why is because it's not very good. <laughs> um, and the reason why it's not very good is because it was very clear to people seeing it for the first time that it wasn't authentic. I mean, there was, I don't know if you saw that, there was a throwaway line there by a young man who said, the blogs were going crazy. No 25-year-old says the blogs are going crazy. <laughs> Only 45 or 50-year-olds writing a script about what they think 25-year-olds are going to say would say blogs are going crazy. And so it didn't get anywhere. And if you remember, there was a moment in the campaign where Mark Penn, chief, chief strategist for Hillary Clinton, said, disparaging Barack Obama's supporters in Iowa, saying, our supporters are caucus goers. His supporters are, look like Facebook. And again, there was this massive disconnect between the old guard and the new guard about what was really happening. So this came about, as you know, and I'm not, I don't know why the music's not playing on this. But everybody's seen this one, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to skip this one. because. But just for a second, just look how well it's edited. And. This sent a message of authenticity, even though it was produced by Hollywood people with a lot of celebrities. It gave, a, it resonated with the internet community because it, it was just plain cool. So no, we can't is the was the was the line for the video previously we saw with Hillary. The for for the video, but now I'm going to. Exp ask you to go see Slumdog Millionaire. If you guys haven't seen that movie, you gotta go see that movie. It's like the best movie I've ever seen in my life. I'm not kidding. I mean, it's like up there with like Star Wars in terms of experience for me. Now, whether you go and see it or not, from now on, if you see that movie advertised, 
or you see a review for it, you'll probably remember that I said what I just said. Or if a friend brings it up, you'll remember that I said that it was a great movie too. And why? Because people's opinions matter. And it's more important than ever when it comes to politics. Because people share their political opinions with each other all the time. They do it around dining tables and water coolers. They do it in the market at the VFW hall, over the back fence, at the playground. It's the same in 2008 as it's been for decades, if not centuries. <coughs> But political conversations are now on steroids. <clears throat> All the different platforms are taking those conversations and making them expand on exponential levels. And I, you know, I, this, I'm sure for most of you that's not surprising, but it really struck home for me about eight months ago when I met the 21st century political pamphleteers. This is a very powerful group of people. And here they are, my mom and dad. <laughs> my parents called me up and said, hey, could you come over and show us how to do more than one email address at a time? <laughs> so I went over to their house, looking over their shoulder, showed them how to add you know, an extra email address in the, in the two line. And then I looked down at the, sub, at the subject, and the subject says, watch this. And it's a link to a Barack Obama YouTube video. Now, in a previous election cycle, it would have taken my parents maybe a year and a half or two, ye two years to meet those same 50 friends and have a political conversation and, or even meet them and hope that a political conversation would go on. And they certainly 10 years ago would not have picked up the phone and called their friends and told them to vote for somebody. Nor would they have sent them a political pamphlet because they would have felt that that was too overt. But here, my parents were participating in, the, in this election by forwarding a Barack Obama YouTube video. And I realized that if you repeat my parents tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of times, and then you start thinking about the people who actually know how to do more than one email address at a time, <laughs> you're talking about a completely new political media ecology. And the light bulb went off in my head in a big way that what we're experiencing this election is of a hockey stick jump on a chart in terms of how this technology is going to change democracy. So sound bites are the normal way that we find out about information from our politicians. And as you know, it's because t newspapers and magazines and television have too little time and too little space. The information gets distilled by professionals. It gets repeated over and over again. Remember the Dean's scream? And it dumbs down democracy because we can't get into any detail. But we are now in the era of sound blasts. I don't know if you knew this, but a YouTube video does not get counted as a view unless you've watched the whole thing all the way through. The Barack Obama YouTube video speech on race, which is 37 minutes long, has been seen by about six million people. And that's just on YouTube. And those are people who watched it all the way through. That's not counting where it was seen on MSNBC or CNN or any other site that might have streamed it. So there is an appetite for people to listen to their politicians directly without relying on the mainstream media to distill it down to size. So sound blasts are afforded by the internet. They can be saved, the information can be saved rather than instilled. It can be delivered directly from the source, and it provides opportunity for detail to be examined, and lives in an economy of abundance as opposed to an economy of scarcity. How many people got that? 
or signed up for it. So, but everybody knows what it was about, right? That Joe, that the announcement of, of Joe Biden was was going to be delivered by via text. But here's what's interesting. It doesn't really matter how we find out about Joe Biden becoming his vice presidential choice. Because whether it's email or on CNN, within 15 minutes, everybody's going to know who the choice is, and we're not going to remember what the platform was. But look what they're asking you. The text message said, watch our first joint appearance, not on CNN, not on C-SPAN, not on PBS, but on BarackObama.com. They created their own channel, and they weren't afraid to use it, and they knew that people would watch. And every time someone watches, they had another opportunity to make a relationship happen. So YouTube has become the TiVo of all time. Not only does it allow us to watch political videos, but it allows us to go back and find them from decades before YouTube even existed. And if you remember the Hillary Clinton Bosnia story being replayed, that's a perfect example. So a view is a vote, and we estimated on Tech President that there have been something in the area of 200,000 views of candidate videos this election cycle alone. Barack Obama's videos on YouTube, about 85 or something between 85 and 90 million views. John McCain was about 25. If you add in all the other candidates and the, and the party, the parties, the senators, the congressmen, we think it's something like 200 million. But then if you count all the yes we cans and the no we can'ts and the dear Mr. Obamas and the tens of thousands of voter generated videos that you've never seen but got, got, got seen by someone's 50 or 100 friends, we're talking about over a billion views of political vi videos this cycle alone. It's massive. And if you just give you a sense of how powerful YouTube has become, there's more content put on YouTube in six months than all of TV since TV's been invented. I think someone's going to have to come up with like a Moore's Law for how, how, how long it takes for content on YouTube in total to double, whether it's every three months, every six months, or every three weeks. So, how many people here know how to edit video on their computer? So it's about half of you. So the ha half of you are literate. It's a term that I coined which means people who can not only understand complex ideas as they're presented to them, but also can create them. And if you think about how many flat screen TVs and iPhones and other devices that are able to present video. The display area for video just continues to grow exponentially. And the tools are getting easier and easier to use. So the other half of us who don't know how to edit video right now on the web are going to be able to do that as well. And that facility is going to start challenging text. Whether writers like it or not, it's going to happen. You look at the New York Times right now, the New York Times has got lots of video. It's push, pushing, it's, it's competing with CNN for eyeballs, not around text, but around video. And every major media company is doing it, but they're having to compete with a bit, much bigger um, co competitive pool now because bloggers are experimenting with video, you're experimenting with video, and as we saw in this election, with a billion views, lots of people are exper experimenting with video. But if you think about it in relation to portable devices. First 10 years, there were 1 billion cell phones. Four years later, it doubled. 18 months, 3 billion. By 2010, it's estimated there's going to be 5.5 billion cell phones, 75% of all humanity. And I bet you by 2015, the cell phones that those people are going to have are going to make your iPhones look like a Motorola brick from 1998. Think about that as an infrastructure for communication. 
By 2020, it's probable that every single human being on the planet will be connected to every other single human being. There'll be, there are people on the planet now who do not have clean running water or a place to sleep, but they have cell phones. And they sent four, 43 billion text messages last year alone. <laughs> so I now want to explain to you why I get excited about this technology, because I think that we are on the cusp of watching technology solve problems that were intractable. Not just because kids in mouse squad wire schools and graduate go to college, but because people are figuring out how to use these tools to fix things that government should have fixed or government was unable to fix either because of corruption or lack of imagination and innovation or just plain stupidity. Does anybody know what PCM is? So in Africa, people with cell phones usually can't afford the air time. So they text regularly. And they get about seven free texts a day. And the most common text is PCM, three letters. And it means, please call me. And they send it to somebody who has time on their phone so that that person calls them. That leaves 157 characters in a text message unused. So, as you well know, South Africa has a crisis. 40% of the country have AIDS, 90% have cell phones, 200 million PCMs a day are being sent in South Africa. The government of South Africa has been in denial about AIDS since its beginning, and is still in denial, and fights every attempt to try to educate its public about AIDS, getting tested, and getting treatment. I'm on the board of an organization in Maine, another conference actually, called PopTech. PopTech focuses its attention on social innovators <coughs> all around the world. And we saw a program, an AIDS education program in South Africa that was doing amazing work without any resources and put them together with some innovators around cell phone use. And we convinced the local telephone company to give up the other 157 spot text uh, letters in the text message that weren't being used by PCM and embed a public service announcement inside <coughs> that text so that every time someone sent PCM, the person receiving that text message would then get a 157 character message. That project was launched in 2008 by PopTech. We partnered with the second largest telco in Africa. One million text messages a day were being sent with that message. And the National AIDS Hotline increased its call volume by 200% within days. We would have gone, that was only 5%, by the way, of all the text messages that MTM was sending. The reason why we didn't go for the 100% is because we knew that the AIDS hotline wasn't able to receive the calls. There's no infrastructure for the calls that they would receive. But now, with every single call, every single text message, there's a database to follow up with the people who actually responded. And that's what it looks like. Now, I'm missing the title here, sorry about that. But this is, uh, this is a project called Project Vote Smart, which was posted on, a, on our tech president blog as an idea by uh, Alison Fine and Nancy Scola. Is that right, Nancy? In October, of 2000, uh, October of this year. And the idea was, imagine if we could use Twitter as a tool for monitoring polling stations. Now, normally, we as a... Americans, or frankly anybody in a, in a democratic world, thinks that monitoring polling stations is the responsibility of the government. 
or the authorities. And if you remember in 2004 and 2000, we had heard lots of stories about voting irregularities. So we partnered up with the Election Protection Coalition, Rock the Vote, Common Cause, YouTube, Twitter Vision, NPR, Social Media Desk, PBS, Brits, Independence Year, and other organizations. We launched on Election Day, and in about 16 hours on Election Day, 10,000 10, uh, reports were delivered. And it kind of looked like this. People were submitting their observations, and they were getting mapped in real time. And the surprising thing were, other than the fact that there were long wait times, there were no real incidents. You didn't hear about state police blocking a road and pointing buses filled with African Americans down the wrong road so they couldn't vote. And you didn't hear about polling stations closing early. What you did hear about was somebody's registration not being there, or some registrations being lost. But for the most part, this election went off without much of a hitch. Now, I'm sure that if we had been had a closer election, we may have heard more of these stories. But I maintain that people aren't going to be pointing buses down the wrong road to vote in this country anymore, and maybe in other parts of the world too, because there is a sense that there are all these eyeballs, all these cell phone cameras, all these video cameras everywhere. And because of that, there's people maybe, if not consciously or subconsciously aware of the fact that they're probably going to get caught. It's harder and harder to do something that's that bold and not be seen. Now, there are two schools, in my opinion, in the use of technology in politics. One school believes that technology can be used to maintain top-down political control. And that we're seeing with the Republicans for the most part, and now they're, I've been telling my Republican friends who come to the Personal Democracy Forum, who are techies, that this election is really, really good for them because they're now going to get a lot of phone calls and are going to be asked to do the party. It's going to happen a lot faster than it did for me when I was going to Washington in 2000 or 2001. But there are other organizations that are very much top-down political <coughs> organizations. And the perfect example of one on the, on the progressive side is Move On. Now, it's true that Move On asked its members to vote on who they wanted to be president, and they ironically chose Barack Obama. If those of you who didn't know, Move On got started during the Clinton years in the, as an attempt to try to get beyond the impeachment hearings. And here they were endorsing Barack Obama against his wife for president. But for the most part, Move On is an organization that's run by a handful of people who decide on a general direction for the organization, and they broadcast that to their members. And those members are people who are very busy with their own lives, who have, for the most part as well, delegated their political opinions to move on because they're busy and they go, you know, I pretty much agree with move on. If move on says I should do this, that's what I'll do. Now, they introduce some people to, ha they have, they introduce some people to each other at house parties, but they're not thinking about turning move on into a Facebook for progressives. It's about, to a large degree, a handful of people controlling an email list. But there's a second school of thought in politics that believes that the technology creates a more robust and participatory democracy, where being involved in civic life is no longer abstract, but actually relevant to your daily life. And if we, you know, we've been dumbed down by our political system for decades. We've been under investing in public education, a pillar of democracy. It's not surprising, and we've been living in a soundbite era of political information. It's not surprising that we only get 60% of our population to vote, and very few people join community boards or do other kinds of work because they don't think it matters or they can make any difference. So a few years ago, we, um, we, we created an organization called the Sunlight Foundation in Washington. A woman by the name of Ellen Miller, who founded Center for Responsive Politics, was approached by a, a gentleman by the name of Mike Klein who wanted to make a movie about corruption in Washington. She convinced him that making a movie wasn't going to be enough, that he should really think about making a website. She came to me and my partner, Mika Sifri, and asked us to design a program. And we built a plan to basically take as much government data 
that was being published in analog form and make it available in digital form so that people could actually start sifting through it, mashing it, and finding information out themselves and holding their elected leaders accountable. Just to give you an example of how screwed up our political system is related to data, the Senate right now collects all their donor information in digital form. You make a contribution to Senator Schumer, $1,000, he's got a database, he records it, he can look you up in a second. He's required by law to report that to the Federal Election Commission. What does every senator do? They take their digital files, they convert them to paper, they hand them to the Federal Election Commission in paper form. Why? Because it takes the Federal Election Commission somewhere between three and six months to convert it back to digital form. And by that time, the election's already done. There was a bill introduced in the Senate this past year to require senators to file their donor information in electronic form. A senator put a secret hold on it and it never came to the floor for a vote. Think about that. Senators are allowed to put a secret hold on a vote where if they don't want to have something to vote, they have this right to just shelve the whole thing. Just put the whole bill aside and nobody, no, nobody tells anybody who, who did it. Sunlight Foundation had built up a community of people, started asking people to start calling their senators and congressmen and asking them if they had put, been the ones putting the secret hold. And one by one, every single senator was called the only one who refused to answer the question was Senator Mitch McConnell from Kentucky. And it came past that he actually was the one who did it. But the point here is, is that there is a massive disconnect between our country's legislative system and the use of digital information and our own. And I'm very encouraged by the fact that the Obama administration not only has telegraphed it in his policy documents as a, as a uh, when he was running as a candidate, but now there's serious talk about the appointment of a CTO, this is country's first chief technology officer, that might actually start solving many of the problems related to giving us the information that we actually own. Not secret information that Homeland Security keeps, not the UFOs in Utah, the data about what our elected leaders are doing with our mo money and time. Another example related to how technology can solve problems and save money related to politics and the Sunlight Foundation was that Senator Obama and Senator Coburn in 2006 <laughs> proposed a bill where, which would put all federal grants and contracts in a searchable database so that people could see where the government was spending their money and a $14 million appropriation for the creation of that database was signed into law. And the Office of Management and Budget was then charged with the responsibility of building that database. The Sunlight Foundation gave fedspending.org, which runs a program called OMB Watch, the arch enemy of the Office of Management and Budget, a $350,000 grant to build that database themselves. And now, OMB has a contract with OMB Watch <laughs> to fulfill the mandate of that bill, saving the government $13.5 million and getting it up and running within two months. That's drama, if I ever heard it. So I already used this line. I think it's still true. I, if we could do a survey right now, I'm sure that 90% of Congress would not know what a server is. But we're gonna have a president that not only gonna have a laptop on his desk, but who actually knows what a server is. That's change. This is a line I like to use all the time.
People always think of technology as just a piece of the puzzle. They don't realize it's actually a tool and it supports solving a lot of other problems. It's really critical that that CTO, if, if Obama appoints him, is not somebody that's delegated to an office at, off, at, the, at the Office of Management and Budget, but is actually an advisor inside the White House that has the President's ear and can sit in on cabinet meetings and actually oversee the entire executive branch and the federal bureaucracy. Putting the CTO in the Office of Management and Budget would be the same as if in 1860 the chief locomotive engineer got a desk at the Horse Traders Association. So there's a great site, if you haven't seen it, it's called ObamaCTO.org, where people are suggesting ideas of what the CTO should focus his attention on. And people are voting on which ones they like the most. And not surprisingly, one of the biggest ones is making sure that the internet is free and as accessible to everyone as possible. You know, when I ran for public advocate in New York, does anybody know what the public advocate does? Some of you do? Public advocate is second in line to the mayor in, in hierarchy but has a very small portfolio. It's basically a city council person without a district. And the responsibility of the public advocate is when every other avenue getting something solved fails, the public advocate is supposed to take on your cause. If you can't get your, you know, if the hospital won't take you on, or if the school won't let your, your kid in, or you're having trouble paying a parking ticket, public advocate's your place to go. One public advocate for eight million people. Now my idea was that that office should be reinvented. That it shouldn't be just one person, it could be tens of thousands of people. If you think about all the people in New York City who volunteer in parks, volunteer in schools, uh, clean up parks, join community boards, feed the homeless, there are tens of thousands of public advocates who are already working to make their city better. They're just not connected to each other. You know, I believe this adage is really, really true. Organized minorities are always more powerful than disorganized majorities. The Dade County Election Commission that stopped the Chad counting in Florida in 2000 with Al Gore and George Bush was controlled by Cubans. And they stopped the Chad counting because they didn't want Al Gore to be President of the United States. You can look it up. So my idea was is that if you could maybe build a public advocates network, then you could, for example, the mother with a child with asthma in the Bronx, who's, not, who's fighting for more money for asthma care in the hospitals in the Bronx, she could find out about another single mother or another mother with a child with asthma in Queens fighting for the same thing. And together they could, get, they could show up when the city council is having a hearing the most ridiculous time of, of the day, 10 o'clock in the morning during the work week when nobody in a working class background could possibly go. And if 50 people showed up at a city council hearing on a given issue, I can assure you that every single city council person would actually show up too. Because right now, they only show up, make a speech, and leave. That's why they ask you to submit written copies of your, of your, of your testimony at city council hearings because they claim that they're going to read it after later. But the point of it was that you could leverage all the energy of all the public advocates together and build a better public advocate's office. And one of the biggest, tenet, uh, um, biggest uh, this tools that I was planning on trying to implement to make that happen faster was getting low-cost wireless networks built throughout New York so that working class families didn't have to pay 50 or $60 a month to get online, which is more than most of them can afford. When I went to the New York Times editorial board for my endorsement interview, which is a very, very important piece of the electoral puzzle, getting their endorsement, I got 45 minutes, of which I had to spend 30 explaining to the New York Times editorial board what Wi-Fi was. The New York Times editorial board doesn't read its own business section. I ran into Mike Bloomberg 
when I was running for office. We were standing in line at another endorsement interview for the Amsterdam News. He was introduced to me by, his, by one of his aides. And he said, oh yeah, you're the Wi-Fi guy. Would we have to dig up the streets? I swear to God. <laughs> That's why I'm really excited about 2008. Because now with Facebook and MySpace, when I say something like Public Advocates Network, everybody starts to understand what I'm talking about. And all the people running for public office, the public advocate this coming year, are now all calling me up and saying, oh, Andrew, come on, can you come help us, please? They don't really get it either, but at least they're calling. <laughs> so I want to see a situation where I don't have to go into a public school or someone else like me from when I was running my nightclub have to go into public school and try to figure out how to get computers into the kids' hands. Those kids should have the technology now and as much of it as they can, and they should have it all the time. The average kid in a New York City public school gets to spend only one hour a week with a computer. How productive would you be if you could only spend an hour a week with a computer? We've, you know, in our, in our, in our society, if you, in 1997, if someone gave you a business card without an email address on it, you wouldn't be surprised, because there weren't a lot of people with email addresses in 1997. And there weren't that many great websites, that's why we called it surfing. Now, if you got a business card from somebody who didn't have an email address on it, either they were doing it on purpose, or they're a true Luddite. And if you look at, you know, the way companies were thinking about the internet in 1997, they would do full page ads in the New York Times and their website address would be in the smallest possible letters at the bottom of, this, of the page. But what's happened in 10 years? Every Fortune 500 company in the world has either built or is on its way aggressively building a network where their employees, customers, and suppliers are connected on 24-hour dynamic, 24 dynamic networks regardless of whether they're using laptops, Blackberries, desktops, cell phones, it doesn't matter. If you buy a Sony digital camera case from Sony in leather, when you press buy, the cow knows it. <laughs> Imagine if we could get parents, students, and teachers on 24-hour dynamic networks accessing all the world's information and resources. Schools are only open 15% of all the time of the year. That's a huge infrastructure that's only accessible for a small amount of time. It's not that kids shouldn't be going to school, but they should be able to access learning moments whenever they can occur. And the reason why that's not happening is because we don't have any leaders in our society that have a vision on how to get there. And I believe that this technology and us are going to do it, for those, do it in place of those leaders who failed to do it for us. So Big Brother is here, everybody. There aren't going to be a lot of police officers pushing, uh, pointing buses down the wrong street to get, get to the voting booth in the future. But here's the important part. I don't have a problem if the government watches me as long as I can watch the government. And so yes, Big Brother is here, and it's us. Thanks very much. Sure. We have about uh, know, seven minutes for questions. Anybody? Please? So, I'm very intrigued by your education notion. That, is, it, is it that the kids that were doing this mouse thing were, because they were doing hands-on work, they got more into education? Or were they just self-selected and they would have graduated anyway? Sure, there's always a, you know, the common argument about programs in schools is that there's what they call the Hawthorne effect, which is that you know, people <coughs> who are being studied are the ones that actually do better. And it's not like we've taken random kids, so it's not a perfect situation, but um, what, what we've discovered is, is that 
once the kids get introduced to the technology, they, their personalities change, their energy level changes, their willingness to be social changes, and they start actually taking responsibility. It's not unlike the AV kids when we were going to school. You know, they, they maybe were doing a little better in, in certain courses so the teachers didn't mind if they spent the time, but ultimately it was a path to change their lives. And more importantly than that, those kids are building networks faster than the adults can. So they're serving many more kids and many more teachers and eventually teaching their parents. So they're actually bridging the digital divide on behalf of a community that hasn't been able to get its elected leaders to do it. And I didn't mention this earlier, but the, one of the major reasons why we don't have, why this country is rated 19th in broadband penetration is because we have a corrupt system a duopoly between the telcos and the cable companies that have been giving hundreds of millions of dollars to senators and congressmen for decades that have prevented them from innovating and creating competition to allow us to, to A, have broadband defined as something greater than 200 kilobytes per second. The rest of the world measures it at about 1,000. And B, put the entire country on a 21st century economic platform. So. Back to the Sunlight Foundation, if we can expose some of that corruption, if we can expose those donations, then maybe we might be able to change the system in a way so that those kids and those parents don't have to pay 60 or 70 dollars a year to get internet access. So I'm not really answering your question, but um, but just you just made me realize I forgot a big piece of the puzzle, which is the corruption in our cable and telephone industry. Please. Uh, in your program, are you teaching kids how to produce viral videos, how to think about legal issues? Sure. It, it depends on the, the, how, you know, the first, uh, first idea is to get them ha how to fix computers and get the computers to work. And then if the teacher sees that the kids have done that really well, then they start working on building a website for the school. They start building, you know, other kinds of platforms and they start recording the plays and the sporting events and it, they, it becomes a multimedia operation before long. If they have the equipment and they have the you know the desire, but yes, they do. We don't run it though. It's really up to you know the whole goal is basically hand the school a program where they can actually turn their kids into you know uh, a mass squad and then let that group of people decide what they want to do with it. I'm gonna push your optimism a little bit. You seem very optimistic and then start with <laughs> sorry we're we're, we're fighting no against each other. Um, so but I mean. What are the excuses for not having direct democracy, having representative democracy, having proxies in front of you? Is because there's it's hard to you know make that happen. Would you think optimistically that these technologies that you're talking about, democracy, used for democratization, could maybe eliminate that? We could we could maybe say, well, there's no real excuse for not being able to have everybody vote on any particular house bill or senate bill that they wanted to, and. Eliminate the process. Yeah, I, I think that a lot of people actually come to that, you know, think that, when I, and I've heard this before, you know, in my sort of utopian vision that somehow this is just going to continue to the point where we're all going to be like one big coliseum and we're going to be thumbs up and thumbs down on every single referendum and that, you know, we don't need representative democracy anymore. Um, we actually just put together a, a, a book called Rebooting America where we asked 40 people to write essays about what our democracy might be like if in 1787 our forefathers had the internet at their disposal, how would they have designed it? And I actually, you know, if you think about how it was initially designed, I'm, I'm you know, foreshortening this a little bit, but basically we were all too busy in the fields working that our forefathers said, well, let's have representatives who would actually spend their time finding, doing the, doing the country's business, getting into detail and understanding what issues needed to be addressed on our behalf and we would vote them into office and they would represent us. Perfectly normal course of events. But the whole thing started to mutate when politicians started gerrymandering districts, spending all their time worrying about getting themselves reelected and not actually spending any time getting delving into details or assigning some staffers who were basically talking to lobbyists who were also connected to the people giving them money to put them in office. So I actually envisioned sort of a hybrid over time where 
you might not ask the entire country to vote on a referendum, but it's going to be a lot easier to find the smartest people on a given issue and get them together. Well, I'm, I'm, again, telling the optimism there, I mean, I think that on the one hand, yes, that's, that's one reason why, you know, this idea that one person is spending time to do detail on a thing. But the other flip side of it is that we have a monarchical principle, we have an aristocratic principle embedded in the government the forefathers put there in order to reduce the amount of democracy, reduce the amount of power that the masses, you know, have. And I think something that technology is doing is breaking them down. And so, you know, how do you respond to, to that? You know, well, I actually, actually, breaking down things that well, I actually think that it's going to, sh I think that we spend far too much time on elections and not enough time on civic life. There's all this attention on the electoral process, and then it's over, and we sort of forget about what to do next, although everybody's talking now about how the Obama campaign is going to leverage this network and put it to work. Think of it this way. The, the, you know, the, mayor, the mayor of New York in the 20th century would walk out of his house and see a pothole and go, I wonder where I'm going to find the money to hire people to find the vehicles to drive around the city and find all the potholes. The mayor of the 21st century maybe will be smart enough to ask everybody in the city to take a picture of a pothole and send it in. It's really about this sort of conversion from the economy of scarcity to the economy of abundance and knowing when you can actually leverage these tools in order to get something solved. And I think it's too hard, it's too early for us to really make concrete decisions about this is the right way or that's the right way because this is all brand new. It was just started. You know, our the analogy I always use for our political system related to technology is, that, is imagine if we were all farmers and ranchers and all our friends were farmers and ranchers and we had hay balers and barn builders and cowboys working for us, blacksmiths, and we all went to the steam engine convention or the steam engine speech and someone showed us the steam engine. So we go back to our friends and show them the steam engine and they go, you know, maybe we can use it to carry our horses to the field. They can only think of it in one step. They don't see the, not only the evolutionary opportunity, they don't see the revolutionary opportunity. So I'm optimistic that a new generation that's more comfortable with these tools will figure out how to make democracy work better. And, and, and that's what makes me optimistic. Yes. Um. What is major countries that don't have democracies and are very close, like Iran and Burma, um, to get technology to work for the people rather than whenever there's something happens, the government just like shuts it all down? Uh, do you know of any projects that are being done that kind of stop that from happening or sides by Well, I mean, in third world countries or countries that are dictatorships? In dictatorships or closed societies. Um, well, I've, I've heard of stories where people are using Google Maps to expose the king's, you know, um, you know, palaces and um, examples where people, and there's lots of examples in China where people are figuring out ways to circumvent the Chinese government's attempt to try to shut things down. Um, there are secret websites that are up for like, that access full information on the, on the web for like two or three hours and then the, the government finds out about it, shuts it down and then they just jump to another site and it's sort of cat and mouse. Um, um, there isn't, you know, I've been spending a lot of time in the last year and a half focused on U.S. technology, so I'm not as, as uh, versed in that, but I am sure. I mean, we heard about the Orange, the Orange Revolution. That was 100,000 people maintaining a presence in the main square in Kiev 24-7. And the reason why they kept 100,000 people there is because they were texting other people. When someone had to leave, a text was sent out, a new person would come. So there was always 100,000 people there. That was done with technology over, overnight. There, there are lots of examples. Um, but now that you've asked me the question and the election's over, I'm going to go in and make sure the next time I get asked that question, I've got a better answer for you. Actually, the answer is uh, Global Voices in its uh, partnership with the Berkman Law Center and Harvard. They do a really good job of taking a look at the whole global experience in the blogosphere and trying to expose some of the fallacies that are going on to those nations. They also try to essentially translate the blogosphere as it's happening in real time. Anyway, I'm going to stick around for a little while. I'm incredibly flattered that you came to listen to me, and thank you for indulging me with my sloppy uh, PowerPoint presentation. But um, I'll give you all my email address. It's andrew at personaldemocracy.com, and I'm happy to continue this conversation if you want to. So thank you very much.